Okay, so I was asked to speak to you guys today about my career and where I, my background, where I come from, kind of what I've done. And the first thing I like to point out when I give speeches like this, I am a farm girl from Paradise, Utah. I grew up on a farm. I have really great parents. Um, and people oftentimes ask me, when you know, where are you from? And I tell them that. They're like, how did you get where you're at? And I think that's actually a very, it's a good question, but it's also one that makes, I want to say back, how come you're stupid? <laughs> because anybody can do anything. It doesn't matter where you're from. It's how you use your brain. So that's message number one that I want you guys to understand. It does not matter at all where you come from, what your background is, what your family's like. Hopefully you have a great family. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You can do anything you want to do. I you know, like to point out President Obama. Whoever would have thought he was going to be President of the United States? When you look at his background, where he came from, that's another good example of it's a dumb question you're asking me. How did you get where you're at? Because I'm smart sometimes, not all the time. Just, you know, if you know how to work and you use your brain, you can do anything. So um, a little bit about my history. I graduated from Utah State in 98 or 99, I forget, in history over at Haas. I had no idea what I was going to do. So part of, part of my strategy slash it wasn't really a strategy is, and this is point number one of advice, don't be somewhat structured. And I would suggest that you were more structured than I was, but don't be so overstructured in what your aspirations are for the next 20 years that you miss opportunities as they come along. Because I graduated from history, everybody else was gonna be a history teacher in high school. I was not gonna do that. I didn't know what I was gonna do. I just liked history, so I figured if you study something you love, you'll make a career of it. And immediately when I got out of um, college, I did have an opportunity to arise to move to Jordan. Where I started a firm, a technology consulting firm, with several friends, four of whom had just finished their MBAs at MIT and electrical engineering degrees. It was the dot-com era. The professors at MIT positioned themselves. They were quite interested in developing Jordan because at the time it had no economy. So they took us dumb kids and they assigned themselves one to each of us uh, to get three million dollars in funding and we started a firm. The very first project that we built was Microsoft Messenger 1.0. We did that project. So those are the kinds of things that we did. Um, we later opened that same operation. We expanded into China and what we were was offshore development for technology. Our market was strictly the United States, but our developers were based in Jordan and China because there was highly educated technical populations there, but, and we didn't have to pay them as much as you would have had to pay technologists in the, in the United States, but we still paid them very well and impacted those countries. From there, I went, I, and I traveled a lot during that time. I, you know, I would get on a plane on Friday nights in China and I would land in Jordan because it takes that long to fly Monday morning and have to go straight into the office. My entire weekend was spent on a plane in airports. And after about two years of this, I was exhausted. And we had also determined that we were gonna either gonna go public and we failed miserably, which was great for us because had we done that, we too would have gone the way of all the dot coms. We held on, turned it around, and we sold our company to Microsoft. So about two and a half years into it, I knew in a year we were selling, and I had an opportunity to go to Target Corporation and work in my job in, in the Middle East company in One World Software was training and PR. And I had to raise a lot of money. So I wore these two hats, and they were both full-time hats, and that I worked a lot. So I did training on the one hand, and I did PR on the other hand, but there was a very specific reason around the PR that we did. It was strictly to raise money, other rounds of funding that kept us in business and which ultimately let us execute our exit strategy, which turned out to be selling it to Microsoft. So I kind of got a little bit of a reputation out there for being able to use the media to raise money because I didn't know that was a good way to do it. Me and the CFO just got together and said, or the CFO and I, that was awful English. I don't speak English very well, I warn you. Um, 
we got together and said, we have to raise two more rounds of funding. We don't really know how to do this. And I said, I think if you tell the Wall Street Journal, they write it, maybe people will call us. And it worked. So ended up having a career in PR, and that's kind of how it started. Again, back to the, I'd recommend you guys were a little more structured, but when the opportunity comes up, be a little bit flexible because you never know what's going to happen. The other point of advice, try things. Try opportunities that come up. Um, which So I went to Target Corporation, spent a couple there years there in the university. I built the e-learning system for the company across the country. And I was there two years. When it came time to renegotiate um, the job that I had been hired for, I realized something very important about myself. I was miserable at Target. I was 26 years old, and I had a great job. I was in an executive level position. My peers were 50 years old. They'd worked their entire lives to get to where they're at. And then this young punk comes in. And so it was a bizarre situation for me to be in. But I knew I needed that experience on my resume because it's a Fortune 50. It's a publicly traded company. It's Target. I learned that I hate structure. I hate it. It was a publicly traded company. There's rules that you have to follow because the SEC requires it. There's investors that you're, you have to report to. That's required. That stuff didn't bother me. What bothered me was the corporate culture. I got written up by... affected my salary because I stayed past 6 p.m. and worked, and that upset one of their um, core values of work-life balance, and therefore I was not a good employee. And for some people, that's the exact life they wanted. For me, I'm like, are you seriously kidding me? I have to go home by 6 p.m. or I don't get a raise? This is nuts. So again, for some people, that's the life that they want. For me, it was not the life I wanted. So the next role that I went into after that, I actually started my own company because I said, okay, I can work as much as I want. When I don't want to work, I can take that time off. But I would rather be crazy busy than not have enough to do. That's when I go crazy. And that's what I learned from Target. So point number two, or three, I don't know what number I'm on. Before you start your career, think really, really hard about the kind of person you are. Do you like structured environments? And just because I don't like them doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. You have to think about this for yourself. Because I hated my life for two years. I really hated that position. And I like Target as a company. I like the people that I worked with. I am not a structured kind of person. I like mayhem. I like change. I like creating something instead of going into something that's already established and just being one of the wheels in the cog. Now that's important. All the wheels are really important. It's just not my personality. So that is such a good question to ask yourself. Do you like that kind of environment? There's also a great deal of stability around that. In so, other times in my life, when you're making your own thing, there is not stability. You don't know unless you get paid by your clients. You don't have a paycheck coming in. A target, you know every two weeks you're getting X amount of money. You have benefits. When you're on your own, your benefits are, you have to pay them. You have to worry about collecting money. So there's, you know, a benefit to it, and there's stress on the other side. I would much prefer taking the stress of doing it myself than being in that environment because that's how I am. It might be different for you. That is the most important question you can ask yourself before you start your careers. Um, from there, I started my own company, a PR firm, and I won't bore you with the details of my life in PR, but for the last eight, nine years, I've strictly been doing communications and PR. The bulk of, I've never ran an event. I've never done a golf tournament. I've never done any of those things that you see on Sex in the City and Samantha Jones, who was the PR exec, and she would have these fabulous parties. Never done one of those. And in fact, if someone asked me to do that, I'd say, you know, call someone else. I don't know how to do that. What I have done is worked on Wall Street I've done IPOs for companies, including Burger King, and my whole job is to take, when, it, when a firm hires me, they want to evaluate their company on some level. Either it's a private 
company and they need to increase their sales. It's a publicly traded company and they need to increase the value of their stock. Maybe they're doing a leveraged buyout. Maybe they're doing whatever it is. That's the arena that I've worked in, which has led me to career number three in that I've done, I've moved into a lot of investment facilitation and promotion, mostly in Africa. Um, my PR life started, you know, back in the Middle East when we figured out just by default the way to raise money is use the media. And I ended up in New York for several years doing that for companies. And I was approached by a friend whose best friend was the executive director of a United Nations group called the UN Capital Development Fund. And they are the, the it's essentially a bank of sorts. It's a for-profit entity, one of the only ones in the UN, and they do the microfinance loans for the world. At the time, they hadn't really, and, and this was in 2004. So they came to me. My friend had recommended me to this executive director because, again, they're a for-profit agency, and they needed to raise $200 million for sub-Saharan Africa microfinance programs. And my friend said, this girl does that. She can probably help you guys wasn't ever a fan of the UN. So when he came to me, I was like, yeah, I'll help you, but I'm just like for this much time, I have no desire to be in the UN. You know, we'll do this project, but then I'm going back to New York. It was required that I go to Senegal for three months and um, talk to my CEO. At the time I was with a different company. I kind of merged myself into a, another firm and that CEO had asked me to prep myself to take over both firms, and that was my plan. So I did at this point actually have a strategy, and again, I go back to that being flexible part, because I could have missed the boat to an incredible adventure that has been incredibly lucrative, it's been incredibly fulfilling, and it was that one strategic decision. Should I stay in New York, or should I go to the UN? So I went to Senegal for three months, and I absolutely hated it. And we, we had to travel all about. And OK, you have to remember at the time I was young, I was a vice president on Wall Street, spent $2,000 on handbags, had the money. This was my life. And didn't really care about anything else. I was very selfish. And I got plopped in Africa, and there's people starving. And here I am with my handbag that cost $2,000. But these guys, they're starving to death. I'm like, oh, this sucks. And, I didn't really know what to do with it emotionally, so I just kind of shut it off. Went back to New York. I'm like, I don't like that place. And Senegal was also a difficult place for me. Um, it's the only time in my life that I've ever felt. And I've lived now in 10 countries. Never been afraid. I'm not, I think I'm missing the fear gene. I was scared there. There were times I was followed, was nearly raped. I mean, I was in these awful situations, and I was like, I hate Africa. People starve to death. I don't want to, I just don't want anything to do with that. And I hated it. And so I got back to New York. I'm like, oh, I'm home. This is awesome. And it just so happened that the, um, the week that I went home was Fashion Week. And, you know, I was in that world of Fashion Week, and I got to go to the runaway shows, and I was with all the important people, and it was really fun. I'm back in the good life. And if you've ever been to New York, how many of you have been to New York? Bryant, Bryant Park, where the New York Public Library is. There's a big square, and there's a big park. That's where Fashion Week has been held. They set up these tents. And so there's all sorts of advertising around Bryant Park during this time. And there was a, a poster that the UN had put up. OK, I'm a PR person. There's media all over. I'm standing with all these famous people. And I see this sign, and it's UNICEF. And there's a black hand and a white hand. And they're shaking. And it says, we're all African. And then there's a world behind it. And I looked at it. And all of a sudden, I just, I don't know what happened. I snapped. I'm like, oh, I'm not African. I hate that place. And this is all captured in, by the media. I'm like, eh. And my best friend was with me. She's like, shut up. There's people here. And she drags me off. And I'm just on this tirade of, I am not African. That's offensive. Take that down. I'm not black. I'm not African. To date, I married a black man, by the way. And I'm just going on this tirade. I absolutely hate Africa. And oh, was just, I, I'm going to take care of this. They've got to remove that. I was so offended. Whatever. Go on my merry way. Well, as luck would have it, or if you might say, Fate, what's the word? Karma's a bitch, pardon my French. I 
am sitting in my office in my lovely New York life, and I get a phone call from the president of Sierra Leone, which is one of the countries that we'd visited. And when we went on this tour of Africa, we'd always have to meet usually the head of state if he, he or she was available, he and ministers of state. So very important people. Well, when you go to these places that you don't know the first thing about, and they put you in front of their powerful, famous people, if you don't know about them just as a person, they're not famous to you, whatever. And that's kind of how I felt. And I didn't like Africa and I didn't care. So I was very much like, whatever. I just have to raise money for this thing, which we did. And I'm out of here. I don't want anything to do with this place. We're in a war zone, Sierra Leone, sitting with the head of state. This is the place about blood diamonds. O.C. Tanner had been a client and one of the campaigns that I'd done was blood diamonds. So I was like, why am I here? And we're having this meeting with the president. And at the end, he said to me, and my job, I didn't have to do any of the talking in this meeting. I just had to listen to find out what was going on so I could go report and then raise the money. That's why I was included in these meetings. And at the end, I'm kind of lollygagging around, looking around this head of state's office, going, wow, this is interesting. And he says, you. I'm like, yeah? You're a communications person, right? I'm like, yeah. Well, I have a question for you, off topic. And he started asking me about rebuilding his nation the emergency communication system, PR, libel and slander laws, whatnot, whatnot. I did not know the first thing about this gentleman. His name was T. Jan Kaba. And he was very kind. That's all I knew. He was very nice, and I wasn't scared of him because other heads of state we had met, I was like, he's going to chop my head off. I didn't feel that way about this guy. And so we engaged in this conversation. The UN leaders are here. The other leaders are here. And he said, do you think that I'm doing the right thing? And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, some things I do, but here's a couple things that I would change for what it's worth. You know, da-da-da, da-da-da, whatever. Don't, I don't even remember what I said. I just remember that I did say there were a couple things. And I get this call from him. I'm like, what have I done? And he said, well, you know, I want you to come back here and run the communications, the, rebuild the communication sector in this country. And I said, absolutely not. I didn't even hesitate. I said, absolutely not. Number one, all, let me list all the reasons why I am not that person. I had to look on a map where your country was. I don't know the first thing about it. I hate West Africa, hate it with the passion. I'm sorry, I know that might be offensive, but I hate it. I'm not living in a war zone. I don't know about wars anyway. I'm an investor person. No, 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 I went down this list. He's like, I want you to come. I'm like, no, I'm not coming. I'll help you. And this is a head of state, by the way. And again, I just didn't register in my mind, this is the president of a country and so I, I went into my CEO's office. I'm like, get this. I just got a phone call from President Kaba. I told him that I would help him find someone. I am not going there. And my CEO kind of giggled as well. Well, three days goes by, and he calls me again. I said, I'm looking for someone. No, we want you to come. No. And for about a month, every other day, he'd call me. And then he got important people to start calling me, like the Secretary General of the UN. And... I mean, just this laundry list of people. And I was like, um, okay, this is weird. Now this is just weird. You're stalking me. Stop. He said, no, we feel very strongly. You need to come be this person. So then I had to stand back and think about it again. The kink in the strategy again. And I sat down with my CEO. I'm like, okay, this is now to the weird stage. And he said, I agree. You better actually consider this because this really is an opportunity to learn something that is very outside of the norm. I did actually try to find someone that had a skill set that would qualify. There wasn't anyone. Who knows how to do that stuff? Because fortunately, not very often does that actually need to happen that in a terrible, there was a terrible war and we need to build a communication system to fix things. So there wasn't really anybody that had any experience in this. And I'm like, well, I guess I better go. And I felt, you know, I pondered it. I really thought about it. I put serious effort. And I decided, you know, there's some stuff going on here probably that's a little bit bigger than me. And I, at the time, felt morally, if I don't do this, somewhere I'm going to be held accountable for what doesn't happen. I'm very much a believer where much is given, much is required. And I was just at that. I was at this rare, I had this rare opportunity to actually implement that in my life, whereas before I had always said that, but really you don't have an opportunity to do it. And now here I am 
I'm the first one my whole life to have said that I would do this, and am I really going to do it? Well, so I went. Um, long story short, that started um, an incredible transformation for me. I now love Africa. I've been nicknamed the white African. I married an African. I have a half African child. Um, and I have homes there. I absolutely love Africa. In fact, I'm taking um, Dr. Herman with me to Sierra Leone at, in the beginning of March. I've invested my own personal life there. I've invested my own money there. And I absolutely love it. I went there and had the most incredible experience, a very opposite experience of what I had in, in Senegal. And I changed a lot. Now I would much rather spend $2,000 on helping somebody out than buying a handbag. I don't spend that kind of money anymore on handbags, and I actually feel really bad that I ever did because you can take $2,000 and you can help somebody start a business and they can feed themselves. I'm not in the business of giving people food and money. It goes away. I'm in the business of helping them start a business, and I always take a percentage of that because if I do, then I know that they're going to be accountable to something. It might not be very much money. It might profit me $100 that entire year. But what it profited that person was they have to be accountable to someone. There's a lot, there's a huge lack of accountability in that culture. And I know that they can make it. And I know that if I help them learn, they're going to help five people learn. And those people are going to help five more people. And pretty soon, in 50 years, there's going to be a big impact. That's what motivates me now. And I don't, I don't know... Again, strategically, I didn't plan any of that out. At some point in my career, I did have a strategy, and that was when I was in New York. But back to my point number one, be flexible when opportunities arise because you might miss the boat if you're not. And I would have missed a huge boat, and I'm really glad that I didn't. Here I am today at Utah State. I, I came back from – I've been in South Africa. I had a baby three months ago, and I decided I wanted to come home for a while – and raise him here initially because I get malaria a lot and I don't want him to have that. And But he's joining me in Africa in March and um, he, will, uh, he will know that life. I want him to know that life. Um, I want my child to understand what we have and what they don't and that it's our responsibility to help them get that. And again, the way you do it is through private sector development. Someone in here said, you in the pink shirt, you're studying entrepreneurial stuff. That's how you fix these parts of the world. That is the answer. And that, you know, I don't know what, I'm going to actually leave the time for you guys to ask questions. Um, I hope that was useful. Um, that's kind of about me. And again, just remember, it doesn't matter where you come from. It matters what you do with what you have. That's what counts. So, that's me. Do you guys have any questions? Yes? In Africa, there's a lot of corruption and a lot of problems with uh, big distance from the leaders and, and to the people. Do you, how did you manage that in your interactions with Africa? Well, number one, okay, and what I didn't go on to say is, before I answer that question, since that time with President Kaba, I was initially a member of the UN for a year, and I was very frustrated with the UN because what I saw during my time there was the problem that they give, and they give, there's no accountability, and then people come back and say, give me more, when they should have invested, invested, and then people can feed themselves, and they'll go on and invest some more. So when it came time for me to renew that contract, I said no. I can't ethically do this. And at the time, I had been seconded, what they call seconded to the government. The UN will hire someone and pay for them, but then they give that person to the government. It was given to the president, so I worked directly with him. And I sat down with him, and he is also, he was a career UN person, 25 years. And I said, I, I just, I can't do this ethically. I can't, I can't stay in that organization. He said, okay, will you stay with us? And I said, I will. He said, okay, I'm going to get the money to pay for you. And I, then I refocused my PR firm on Africa. And I stayed for several years, and I worked with them. Because I worked with a head of state in that situation, 
and he was a good leader, an ethical leader. I was then introduced to a lot of the other heads of state in Africa, and I know quite a few of them. I've worked with quite a few of them. I've had the opportunity to work with some that I actually have declined for that reason. I don't work with dictators. I don't work with people, with heads of state that don't have the heart of their people, and you know who they are. I don't work with corruption, and I don't, I don't let people blackmail me. That happens a lot in Africa, too. I have had numerous, numerous very powerful people come to me and say, if you don't do A, B, and C, I'm going to ruin your life, and here's how I'm going to do it. And guess what I do? <laughs> I run to the first journalist and say, guess what so-and-so just did to me, and I blast it everywhere because they can't then do anything to me. I make sure that I stay very morally where I'm supposed to be, and I work only with those leaders that do, and I'm very, 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 very transparent. And when I find that stuff, I actually call it out. Um, perhaps at times it's been dangerous and silly or stupid, but, you know, it, it's what it is. There is corruption. It does exist. If you're going to work in that world, you have to know that, and you have to say, okay, what? It is going to confront you, and it is going to come to you, and you have to decide long before what you're going to do when it confronts you and what you're going to do with leaders. I've walked away from a lot of money because I didn't want to engage with corrupt leaders. And I think that's all you can do at this point because you can't change a system unless you're willing to speak out against it. Does that answer your question? Uh, you talked earlier about the first IT consulting firm that you started in Jordan with four other MLT MBAs. How did you get to know them? Um, like, how did you do your networking? And well, there were actually about 10 of us on that team, and four of those guys had just finished at MIT. I just, um, I've been married twice, and I actually, my husband, my first husband, he graduated from here, actually, um, was a friend of these guys. And then a couple of my friends, we just, they were just friends. And we were all kind of crazy and just said, you know, let's do this. Because, well, and also I was moving to Jordan because my husband had just finished his PhD here. He worked for the Central Bank. And so it was kind of this, and Jordan at the time was an awful economy. I mean, they, they literally, um, we impacted, that one company impacted the national GMP positive 3% in our third year. That's how much of an impact we had because there was nothing there. And we didn't even do that much business. It's just that's how bad it was. So we knew we had to create our own opportunity if we were going to live there. And I had to live there. So I'm like, well, and it was just friends. First of all, not at any expense. This goes back to not only about corruption, but it's very easy to go there and exploit people. For instance, um, mining is a big sector there, and, and I've been involved in, in pro setting up you know, projects in mining. And you can either, you can pay those miners $2 a day, and they would just come and kiss your feet because you're paying them $2 a day to extract $40,000 worth of gold every three days. Is that ethical? You can do it, and they'll be happy, but is that really the right thing to do? So that number one. Um, number two, um, remind me what the question so was. I just lost my dream. How do you change the paradigm of the Western? Society? Oh, you use the media. I, this is where I think it's important to be um, a loud mouth. If you're in an area where, for instance, in West Africa, there aren't many Americans doing much of anything there nowadays. And so they know you, and you have a presence. Contact the media and be very verbal with the media. Be transparent with them and let them know what you're doing, because they'll then tell the world. And pretty soon, that speaks for itself. Your actions speak more than anything when you're in these places. So that, that's how you change it. 
it's not going to change tomorrow. It's going to change after you've done it and someone sees your example and they do it. And also for me, this is why I moved into investment facilitation. I can control people getting new jobs. I can control what investments come in and I can ensure that they are ethically motivated to do this. I'm also, I love money and I am in the business of making money. I am not in the business of not making money. But it's one of those, the beauty of the and, you can make money and be very ethically motivated to do it. And that, that's, I think, how you change things. Brandon. Uh, what are some of the businesses that was started there um, from your contributions? And what, I, I, I can't imagine their economy. Like you said, like $2,000, like what is the, the range of businesses you started? What did it take? Um, I've $100 million down to 50 bucks. Um, I've worked a lot in different countries now. Um, in Ghana, two years ago, um, our team helped Cargill, which is the largest private company in the world. Um, they grow a lot of cocoa in West Africa. There's a term that you'll probably hear a lot called value add. What, Africa doesn't have any value add, um, which means they pick the cocoa, but they can't process it into powder. They have to send it out. Then they have to actually buy their own cocoa back. So Cargill put in a hundred million dollar processing plant to keep the value add in cocoa in Africa. So now the West African cocoa growers are, are refining their cocoa product in Ghana. Um, and I've worked on things like helping, you know, in Sierra Leone, helping a group put together a bakery. Um, I think that was like a $6,000 investment. Um, and I actually made them pay that money back. So we did a business plan they pay, I don't know, 50 bucks a month, and they've employed 20 people that all feed their families now very well. These are people that had nothing. So, you know, that's a small scale thing down to when someone wants money from me, I make them either pay it back to me, not because I need the $50 back, but because if there's not accountability, they don't do the right thing with it. And that's an important thing to remember. On a $100, $100 million investment, even a $5 investment, if there's no accountability, they don't do the right thing with it. Um, a, a very small loan was given to a lady to start a, a fabric shop. And I think I gave her $100 to buy her inventory. And I, we worked on a plan of how she was going to pay me back. I think she paid me like, I mean, she still pays $2 a week or something. And she makes like $40 a week, which is a lot of money going. I mean, that's a lot of money there. So in South Africa, um, I've been involved with the purchase of manufacturing plants, um, specifically apparel. I have ownership in some of those. Um, we have a private equity group that operates out of South Africa. And we invest in various projects from infrastructure to mining um, in that arena. Does that answer yeah. your question? Anybody else? Yes. Do you still feel scared to live in Africa at all? Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll stay there forever? Is it yep. a short term thing? Yeah, I don't feel scared at all. There, I'm wise now to things that I should, I'm wise now, and I guess I've grown a fair gene, if you will. But I'm wise to what situations I should stay out of and what I can do. Um, I'm so not scared that I'm taking my three-month-old baby. So that pretty much tells you how not afraid I am. Um, there are places that I will not go, though, like Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've had many opportunities to go there and do work. I won't. I won't. I just won't. Number one, because there's a huge bad dictator going on in that country, and number two, it's just so dangerous that, and, I, and you know, I stand out, I'm white, I'm American. You, there's just places you just don't go, and that's one of them. Um, I'm heavily engaged in South Sudan. That place isn't scary at all to me. Um, Darfur is scary. So you just have to know, if you're going to engage in Africa, this is actually anywhere in the world, even places like France, when you're going to engage somewhere, know what you're getting into. Don't not do it. Just be really smart about where you're at and what you're getting into. Um, you had a question. Um, I, I, I actually have a couple, but I'll just... Um, with uh, these micro-loans, I think one of the biggest um, obstacles is education, wouldn't you say? Yeah. 
um, what kind of time investment or monetary investment is required for, you know, let's say a poverty, like an impoverished person, they, they have an idea, they can do something. Um, what does it take for them to get to the point where you can give them money and they can do something with it? Um, actually, every microfinance, like official microfinance institution that I've ever seen follows this model. It's usually about a two-month training program that they have to go through. They give those loans out in groups. Um, so you have to have a group, and the group has to be accountable for paying back one lump sum. They have to have a business plan. They go to classes. Um, the one that I've been the most engaged with in Sierra Leone, I think it was about a two-month process three times a week. They had classes for two hours about how what is the business plan. You have to also remember that most of these people are illiterate, so there's not reading and writing involved. You have to figure out some other way that works for them. But they have to go to training. They have to understand what payments mean because they don't usually get that either. Um, in some places where it's more sophisticated, it's not that difficult. You just, But there is some training involved and requirements of accountability and what you have to do and what happens if you don't pay back your loan and... There, you know, every MFI has their own training program. I've never seen one that doesn't. Did you have another question? Um, another one was, was uh, for people wanting to, to get into these type of uh, economies of, you know, in, in South Sudan, for example. Um, where's, where's a good stepping stone? Um, is, it, is it be a part of an organization that's already there, or is it, is it too daunting? I, I see, this, this is a really good question. For me, it goes back to the structure thing. I like to create my own thing, because that's what I like. Um, but there are organizations that are already there that you could get involved with. You have to first answer that question for yourself. Secondly, if you choose to go the route of create your own, a very, very, very good first place to start is that country's embassy in Washington, DC, because they all have an economic person. Um, Sometimes they're called an attache, whatever. But they have someone who is in the embassy that handles that exactly. If you want to go to their country and invest, this person will help you understand what opportunities are there and then link you up to the right people for you to be successful in that. Is Partner there, with them. So there's, a, there's almost a, a, a demand for Americans to go. Oh, there's a huge demand. And I will tell you this, in Africa... They have been colonized by the British, the French, Portuguese, and I think in one instance, um, Germany and, and Brussels at one point, or Belgium. They love Americans because we didn't have much to do with colonization because for whatever reason, we just didn't. They love Americans because we're kind of selfish and direct. We're in it for money. We don't, so we're not the bleeding hearts. And that might sound awful, but that's actually the way you fix things, and they know that. So they love to partner with Americans because we're to the point, we work really hard, and it's about making the money back. Because if you do that, everybody, everybody wins. If you make money, you can pay taxes. If a corporation exists, you can create jobs. Those people pay taxes. The government wins. So every, there, I, I highly doubt there's an embassy or a government in Africa that would turn you down if you approach them and said, I'm really interested in investing. Don't know where to start, help me. Um, South Africa specifically um, has an organization for that called Business Unity South Africa, otherwise known as BUSA. And it is a parastatal. The president of that organization is appointed by the head of state, but it has a CEO and it's a very separate organization from the government. They do nothing but facilitate investment. When I was in South Africa, one of the investors that we helped um, well, they're still, we're still in the process of Dunkin' Donuts. They wanted to come into the South African market. You would think that somebody so big as Dunkin' Donuts would know, right, what to do. They didn't. They called Busa and said, we think there's a significant market for Dunkin' Donuts in South Africa. We don't know really where to start. We don't know really how to assess the market. Can you help us? They're helping them. Then we went out and found investors. We went out and found, you know, so there's organizations like that that exist. Um, that incidentally was set up by Nelson Mandela after apartheid ended to engage um, black people who had been very much left out of business and it's worked pretty well.
Anybody else? Can you please remind me why, I know you said you were really, you disliked Africa. What, what was the change again of why you decided to get involved with Africa and the president that contacted you? It was me. I, I had to, I looked at myself and said, gosh, I'm an awful person. And I, I wasn't an awful person. I, 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 you know, I, I think I was a normal person. And everything was about me, and everything was about, I don't, I, 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 I just, it was a very emotional thing to go there and see people dying and starving to death. And lots of them that after you left, they died the next week. And I didn't know what to do with that. I just didn't know what to do with that information, so I just said, I, don't, I hate it. I also, Senegal is a dangerous place. Um, I hesitate to say that about many places, but I actually don't feel comfortable sending anybody that I care about and love to Senegal. Um, I, it's just, they've never had a war, they've never had any civil unrest, and not that they should, but the other countries in Africa that have had that civil unrest and overcome it, they have a population of people that never want to have that happen again, so they forgave each other, and they're just good. And I didn't find that in Senegal. I found a lot of people that stole from me, that tried to hurt me, that saw the white American, so she must have lots of money, let's take her rings, and this kind of stuff. And so I just hated it. I just, ugh. I didn't like it. I still don't like Senegal. I, I, I just don't. And that was your first impression. Yeah, and I thought that everywhere was like that. And then I went to other countries and I realized, my gosh, these people don't have anything. They're giving me the last plate of food they have. Number one, I'm going to eat it. I don't even care what it is. I don't care if I get sick, eat it. And secondly, it, it, you just can't walk away from that and not do something, especially if you've been given the opportunity to. You just can't. No, that was a different project. We, the, the opportunity was, you know, go back and rebuild the communication sector. But from there, it launched into a thousand different things. Yes? How do you think they're helping in other countries or just really Africa? Or do you know if they're doing kind of investor things like that in other places? I know they are. I, yeah, they are. I personally am just focused on Africa because it's what I know and it's what I love. I've also done quite a bit of work in the Middle East. Um, I'm passionate about those areas. It's happening all over the place. Just find the people that are doing it. It seems like you jumped into a lot of different situations where you didn't necessarily have all the experience needed to do that well. How did you get that experience or learn about those? I just, that's a really good question too, and this goes back to the whole take a risk and maybe go off your path a little bit. Doesn't matter where you're from. And I, you can figure it out. I'm not a dumb person, I'm not Albert Einstein, but you know what, you can figure it out because pretty much everybody, that's, here's what I think is funny, when there's some CEO that thinks he knows everything, mostly you make it up as you go along. Am I right, Dave? And anybody who says they know, blah, 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 I'm like, whatever, no you don't. Because every business, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, and there's, look at Citigroup last two years ago, Look at AIG when they failed. They made it up as they went along to get out of it. So you just, you're smart. And have confidence in your own brain and your own power and you can do it. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't. Because I've had many people tell me, you're not, to, in fact my parents, <laughs> primary, they, they don't do this anymore, but every time I'd head off to Africa in a new venture, my dad would sit me down and get so mad at me. Especially when I left Target. How dare you? Don't you understand what you're leaving? Oh, this is... No. And now he's like, let her do her thing. So, I think I'm supposed to be quiet now. Okay. <laughs>